first. I'm Nichelle Polston, along with Shirley Min and Mark Eichmann. We are always open to new ways of learning, so why not math with a rhyme? Early childhood education unlocks the door to a lifetime of learning. But there's another lesson coming into play as well. A tight state budget is blamed for undercutting programs aimed at helping those kids. The Teacher of the Year is one of many educators whose goal it is to help students learn. What makes Virginia Fercucci's class so special? Take a seat and find out. First, your public media news magazine starts now. First this week is all about learning. Later, we'll meet the Delaware Teacher of the Year, but let's start with our first look. How do you grab a student's attention in the classroom, especially when it comes to learning math? Well, we'll introduce you to a Wilmington teacher who certainly has the answer for students in her classroom, and that's through lyrical math. When it comes to strengthening students' math skills, fifth grade math teacher Kazaya Finney is using her rap skills. I grew up in a musical household and have a musical family. And so I realized that the traditional way of teaching students, my students were bored a bit. In the classroom, she's able to keep Warner Elementary School students engaged. Although she's committed to the school's curriculum, everyone is taking notice to her teaching method called lyrical math. I'm just excited about our young people learning math and learning where they are. They enjoy music. If music is going to teach them, then let's do it. Parents have also been introduced to Mrs. Finney's unique approach. When it comes to learning, the principal says excitement from parents is just as important. The parental engagement has definitely increased and the engagement in the instructional core is really important there. And that's what we were able to do in her work definitely spearheaded that. According to one parent, the multiplication chart was her daughter's least favorite part of math. It was a struggle at first, but she's getting them now, so that's awesome. Just take a listen. Simplifying anything with numbers comes natural to Mrs. Finney. 8, 10, 12, 14. Mrs. Finney's students are so intrigued, some have joined their teacher to make an even bigger impact at the school. It does make math easier because it's like you're making rhymes or like songs about what you're doing. When I'm like doing my homework and I can't remember something, I like to think of Mrs. Finney's songs and then now help me out. DJ, play track. Outside of the classroom, Mrs. Finney, along with her husband James, create instructional math videos for students. Whole number to the denominator, then I take that add it to my memory. There are so many different um, students from every walk of life, um, every country, having access to this tool, to this learning tool. There, there are so many different um, students that would benefit just from another way um, and using music as another strategy to get a skill that they have to learn in is just a great idea, you know, and, and I'm looking forward to more students having that access. And more access is possible through the website Lyrical Math, reaching an even bigger audience who may need a little help with math, such as multiplying fractions. All right, so we multiply my whole number to the denominator, then I take that and add it to my numerator. So we need to do 4 times 5 plus 1. 4 times 5 gives us 20, plus 1 gives us 21. And so we put 21 over the denominator 5. Meanwhile, whether it's Mrs. Finney's rap, instructional videos, or one-on-one -on -one time she gives students, Lyrical Math is bringing out these fifth graders' creative side. One kiloliter equals 1,000 liters. Let's flow. One cup, eight through an ounce. One pint, two cups, one quart, two pints, one gallon, four quarts, 
One liter equals 1,000 milliliters. You can keep up with Mrs. Finney and Lyrical Math when you go to lyricalmath.com. You can also catch some of her performances locally where she remixes math with her rhymes. Her next performance will take place at the Delaware Children's Museum in December. Is there any way to judge how the students are, are being successful in this class? Yes and no. Although Mrs. Finney has been teaching for about 16 years, she just introduced her students to lyrical math. But lyrical math has definitely caught the attention of parents who say their children are much more engaged. So hopefully it will do well in the future. And obviously math is a difficult subject for lots of children, especially the kids at, at Warner Elementary. To answer your question, yes, Mark, especially when you compare state math proficiency to math proficiency at the school. But according to the state, uh, nearly five in 10 students do well in math. When you take a look at district numbers, they're pretty close to the state percentage as well. Unfortunately though, Mark, when you take a look at Warner Elementary, barely one in 10 students are proficient in state testing. Well, hopefully this helps. Thanks, Michelle. You can check out this story online at the new whyy.org slash first. Coming up on first, Virginia Fercucci is the teacher of the year for 2018, but to hear her kids tell it, she should be the teacher of the decade. And chocolate is the food of the decade for an ardent couple. It's the business and pleasure of chocolate later on first. Educators agree that the best way to reduce the learning gap between poor and more affluent students is to begin their formal education before children reach kindergarten. But Delaware education reporter Chris Barish is here to tell us how a state decision could jeopardize recent progress. Chris. Hi, Shirley. Child care is a business with low profit margins. The state helps with a program that rewards centers who produce higher quality results. But the state has frozen payments to providers and some say the move undercuts their incentive to improve. At Babes on the Square 2 Child Care Center in Brandywine 100, 160 little stars spend their days in a nurturing learning environment. The goal is to have children ready to excel in kindergarten. We are the base. We begin the process of, of learning, of reading, um, and without the work that we do, children start school not being prepared. Educators consider early learning the most critical component to reducing the glaring achievement gap between low-income children and those of means. For example, in third grade English, 37% of Delaware's poor children are proficient, compared with 63% for children who aren't low-income. That jarring statistic is burned into the mind of Logan Herring. He runs the Kingswood Community Center. It's next door to Wilmington's Riverside Housing Project, one of the poorest parts of the city and home to many Kingswood students. If you can't read, that means you're not just struggling in English class, but you can't read your math books, you can't read your science books, you get frustrated. Everything starts in the early learning stages and we have to be able to address those needs. To help cut the gap, Delaware pays most or all child care costs for poor parents who are working or going to school. Centers who take low-income children also get additional subsidies under a program called Delaware Stars. Centers earn from one to five stars for the quality of their staff, curriculum, and family engagement. This is a center director or an owner saying, I want the best I can possibly give to my staff and the children we serve and the families. Centers rated three through five receive so-called tiered reimbursements of up to $75 a week for every low-income child. The higher the ranking, the higher the subsidy. The state spent $20 million last year on STARS reimbursements. Keating Center has a STAR 4 rating, and the reimbursement money she receives for her 55 children from poor families helps make ends meet. I get about $12,000 a month from the tiered reimbursement at a STAR 4, and that money's gone. It goes to pay for, you know, the increased education of staff. Um, it goes to pay for what benefits I can offer to staff. It goes to make sure that we have a high quality food program. Keating is now going for a star five rating. That would bring in another $4,000 a month. But in September, Babes on the Square and the other 500 star centers received unsettling news. Under Governor John Carney's shared sacrifice budget, they would not receive additional money by raising their star level. There is not enough funding to expand stars and tiered reimbursement in the 2018 fiscal year. Kim Krasnowski, who heads the State Office of Early Learning, said the freeze doesn't signal a lack of commitment to star-rated centers. 
although we've had a very tough budget year, we'd still been able to recognize programs and still provide them with their current tiered reimbursement levels. Michelle Shavitz is executive director of the Delaware Association for the Education of Young Children. She said state officials had assured them funding was going to be sustained, not frozen. Many child care leaders complained loudly at a subsequent public meeting. From the government perspective, you know, when they shared that information, they said, you know, there's a lot of different organizations that have been cut completely. There's different things that have been cut, but we're not cutting anything. We're sustaining you at this level. But when you're a person losing $50,000 a year, then that word sustain means nothing to you, not for all the work that you've done. Child care centers are now preparing to lobby state officials and lawmakers to unfreeze the payments. On their side is Krasnowski, a Carney appointee. Some will have to say, without tier reimbursement, higher level tier reimbursement, I just can't um, offer the same services to these children and families. And then that impacts our community. It impacts children coming into kindergarten. It impacts third grading reading levels. But even without the financial bonus, directors say they will continue the hard work of teaching the littlest learners, especially the neediest. They will run our economy someday. You know, they, they, they don't have to go to jail. They don't have to have services in high school because they're not prepared. Their health will be better because they've been taught how to take care of themselves. What we do right now changes the entire outlook of our state. We visited three star centers while reporting this story. And we watched incredibly dedicated people who don't make a lot of money working so hard and patiently to teach infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. So it's obvious that quality child care truly makes a difference. But whether or not the state will restore the funding is up in the air. So then, Chris, how is the early learning community going about trying to get the money back into the budget, or are they just trying to figure out now how they're going to make do without it? Well, next week, the Cardi administration will hold budget hearings, and early learning advocates will go down to Legislative Hall and, and attend the Department of Education session. They're also lobby lawmakers to try to get the money back in the budget. But there's a lot of special interests competing for precious few dollars, so it might be a tough sell. Okay, between a rock and a hard place. Thank you so much, Chris. You can find this story and other stories by Chris online at whyy.org slash news. Did you just join First in Progress? The best way to catch up is online at whyy.org slash first. Up next, Chris is back with our first person. Colonial School District has created unique themes for each of its three middle schools. Here to discuss this approach to education and other issues in Delaware's sixth largest district is Colonial Superintendent Dusty Blakey, this week's first person. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, I recently visited McCullough Middle School to see the unveiling of the new planetarium. I was surprised to see students from the two other middle schools, the uh, George Reed kids, brought their killer uh, steel drum band, and the Gunning Bedford students delivered those delicious cookies and muffins. So tell us about your novel approach to running these uh, middle schools. Well, actually, it's, uh, the approach really stems from the high school. Uh, we have 19 uh, career track programs at the high school. And so one of the thoughts that we have is, what do you remember most from uh, your middle school experience and most people talk about the hands-on opportunities they have their parents may still have the wood shop product that they made or may have the pillow that they made um, and so we then started to look at those experiences and said hey we can expand on the experiences that are they're already getting at the high school and create a unique approach and get kids really engaged in their education and their future in middle school George Reed has the agriculture, culinary, and business. Gunning Bedford is the visual performing arts, digital media, graphic design. And McCullough is the STEAM middle school with the planetarium. So now how are you going to measure the effectiveness? Well, you know, we will use the traditional measures, uh, you know, the uh, any of your standardized test scores. We have our own common assessments that we use. We use other formative and summative approaches to uh, gauging student achievement. Uh, student achievement is on the rise in Colonial. Um, it's really about engaging students in real-world experiences. You know, knowledge is really important, 
but the application of knowledge is more important. And so we're really focusing on making sure that our students have those foundational skills, but also able to apply them in real world settings and experience things that are important to them. And then we'll see a natural increase in some of the scores on the standardized tests that are offered. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about low proficiency in, in your district and throughout the state, but almost universal promotion. Mm -hmm. Governor Carney told me it like borders on immoral that we're moving all these kids through the system when they lack basic knowledge of math, English, science. So, you know, how do you stop this and, and can you stop it? Or do we just keep moving kids through the system so, and, so we don't have 16 year olds in seventh grade? Well, I think it's a fundamental approach to education. Um, it's important that we engage families and students as early as possible, preschool, pre-preschool. Uh, that's where our money is better spent from my perspective. Um, and so in Colonial, we've really engaged in, we are now the only licensed preschool in the state of Delaware. We're a five-star preschool program. So we're engaging our kids and our families at three. And so it's my belief and it, our belief in Colonial that that's where you make the difference is if you want to change the system, you focus on the front end of the system. And so we're making a concerted effort on focusing on the front end of the system where then we can fill those gaps and are able to make sure that we really focus on student needs and family needs for that matter, focus on the whole child. So when they enter the system uh, in kindergarten and beyond, they have a foundation and they have foundational skills and we can work to fill some of those gaps and work with parents early on when parents are engaged. And then that will change the system all as we move forward. And slowly, uh, those 16-year-olds that may be uh, in middle school, you'll start to see less and less of them because we'll be able to close those gaps on the front end of the system. Now, so briefly on this one, you uh, got a referendum through last year after it, was, it failed once. Right. Uh, was the situation that dire that you might have had to cut all these jobs? And are you in good shape for the uh, next few years? <laughs> the situation was that dire. Uh, we had a $6 million plus deficit that we had to close. The situation is definitely better. Um, you know, thank you to our community for stepping up and, and really passing the second referendum or the second time around. Um, and, you know, we've got more staff in our building than we had last year. Um, we're able to, you know, now breathe. We have some breathing room. Well, thanks again for joining us. Dusty Blakey is superintendent of the Colonial School District. See our full interview online at why.org slash news. This year's Delaware Teacher of the Year uses her captivating spunk to keep her students interested. Our first experience keeps the learning theme going with a trip inside the classroom of Virginia Fercucci from Sussex Tech in Georgetown. I've been nominated before and I've never accepted the nominations. It's a lot of work, to be honest with you, but another huge part of Teacher of the Year is having a platform or a message. And while I've always known that I love kids, I feel that uh, the climate in our nation and our culture right now is such that I have a, a lot to say about academic discourse and empathy and understanding the why behind our students' behaviors. And so more than ever, I have a platform. Do you totally understand the relationship between elements of style and rhetoric? I think that passion begets passion. And so when I'm really hype, they tend to get really hype. <laughs> and then when they're really hype, I get even more hype. So it's just this really symbiotic relationship. Give me statistics and facts that support. Miss mm. Percucci is one of the most like, I don't know, is spunk a good word? Like, she is one of the spunkiest ladies that I know. Like, she just gets up there and she throws herself into everything we do. And I, th I think too often that we're trapped in classrooms where our teacher is expecting us to do something that they wouldn't do themselves or they're not invested in it. So how can we be expected to learn to it? But she is just a teacher that's invested into everything she's talking about. A text logos is easier to detect in something that can be proven with facts and statistics. I absolutely press at our school with curriculum choices. I press that we connect with kids first through writing. And so once they write something and I get to respond to it and I put as much energy into the response as they put into the text, they recognize, okay, so maybe she's in this for more than just a paycheck and maybe she really cares about 
what I have to say. And so I recognize the value of their voices. It's important for students to actually care about their education instead of just doing it for a grade and going through the motions. I think that she really opens up our minds to see a different way of learning in a different environment. I think that she's made me care more about education. Once more, she really does motivate us to do better and to care about the things that we do. And I think that throughout her class, she has really put an emphasis on doing what you want to do. I'm going to play basketball at Arcadia University. But um, even more than that, I'm going to major in secondary English education. So Mrs. Rikichi is my idol in a lot of ways because I literally want to be here. I just hope one day that I can have a classroom that is as inviting and fun and warm and loving as her. It's an opportunity to change people's lives, you know, and especially at this time in their lives, adolescence is so hard. And they're trying to figure out what they believe in and they're trying to figure out a direction. And that, that's really daunting. And uh, I get to help with that and, and maybe leave a positive mark or I just get to be part of their journey. And also more importantly, I learn more from them. One of Fercucci's main focuses is to get our students to understand that they're not just doing schoolwork for a grade, but they're doing it to better understand themselves and the world around them. What do you get when you take a registered nurse and a biochemist and move them to an artsy neighborhood in the Ardens? Chocolate, of course. Karen Smiles of the WHOI program Friday Arts is here to tell us all about it. Not a bad assignment, Karen. I'll say, <laughs> Shirley, this was a good one to get. Uh, a few years ago, when Mary and Stuart Craig moved to the community, they decided to combine their keen interest in the relationship between health and diet with the desire to create handcrafted bean-to-bar chocolate. The question was how to do it with as few ingredients and as little processing as possible. These are some of the nicest beans. These ones are from Belize. Uh, and we pay extra for the ladies usually sit and hand sort. We source our beans through a sorcerer called Uncommon Cacao, which is two young women. One is living in Guatemala and the other on the West Coast, and they help small makers like us. We met them in Belize a couple of years ago when we went on a chocolate sourcing trip. That was where we first really got to understand how cacao is grown and how the farmers go through their process and the central fermentation and how they work with the locals. It's about ethically sourcing chocolate and that's what the uh, Uncommon Cacao does is they have a whole transparency report. So we know our supply chain, uh, we know what the farmers are getting paid, we know exactly you know, where it's coming from, the and what it goes through until it arrives here. It started in the summer of 2014 with really a simple question, which was, can you make chocolate, dark chocolate particularly, with unrefined sugar? And Mary's role in, in nursing, I was uh, doing work on the health benefits of unrefined ingredients. One of those ingredients was unrefined sugar. So, on, get on the internet, a little bit of research later, not only did I discover that I couldn't find anybody that had done it, but there was this whole bean-to-bar movement out there that we weren't familiar with. It wasn't really the name we came to, but the logo, because it's an ancient Celtic symbol, and it means balance. You know, a lot of times you eat a food that can be healthy, but it doesn't taste very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we felt we were trying to balance those two things, the taste and the nutrition. Cacao bean is, is the seed uh, of the fruit of a tree. And so uh, we all I think, understand that that's going to be inherently nutritious. All of our chocolate has at least 70% cacao beans. Uh, science suggests that you have to have at least that level to have all the health benefits that are associated with cacao. The big makers, maybe 10% cacao. You know, we're talking 70% and above. So a lot of people say, oh, it's bitter or it's strong, or, and right. it's because they're not used to it, and you kind of have to develop a palate. And that can be a challenge. You tasted the Guatemala that was sweetened with the 
unrefined cane sugar. Now this is a same cacao, but sweetened with just dates. It's good. We have some young kids come up and they're like, no, I really like this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a real mixed uh, result. Right now around Wilmington, we have um, Delaware Local Food Exchange at Trolley Square. It's Wig Wine and Independence Mall here in Wellington. In, in Newark, Newark Natural Foods Co-op and a small coffee shop over there called Little Goat. They're the first coffee roasters in Newark, all about sustainability. We need to stay local. Uh, let's not to worry too much about distributors and getting out into other states. There's plenty for us to do locally. And the reason we make these small bars is that this is your daily serving size. So we like portion control. <laughs> we don't encourage people to eat a whole large chocolate bar in one sitting. Most of the time it doesn't seem like work. That's how it tastes. Now, there are a few other locations in the area where you can purchase double spiral chocolate, and they're all listed on their website, along with how you can order from their online store. And on the website, you'll find so many different flavors, which we didn't have time to talk about, like uh, raspberry, there's ginger, there's banana, there's green tea, there's even chili peppers. So there's bound to be something to please everyone. So they all sound really good. How many flavors did you try? And then did you have a favorite? Oh my gosh, I, I tried as many as they would let yeah. me try. <laughs> um, and I think my favorites were the uh, vanilla bean, the raspberry, and I really liked the green tea. Mm -hmm. And you liked how they were like in bite-sized pieces. Yeah, yeah, that was nice about the um, the tasting. They call them nibs. So it's a very small piece that you're tasting. So you're not getting overwhelmed and, and too full. And it's just enough for you to get the taste of the chocolate. And then how different is it then from you know dark chocolate, for example? Well, it actually tastes a lot different than the dark chocolate most of us are used to eating because mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously um, a little bitter mm -hmm. um, and it's not as sweet. But you find yourself being satisfied because you don't really miss the sugar, so you don't eat as much. And mm -hmm. that's a good thing, right? Yeah, that's a very good thing. Sounds good to be paired with wine. <laughs> that, it does. Well, if you want to learn more, go to doublespiralchocolate.com. Karen Smiles is one of the producers on Friday Arts. So, Karen, what's the next story that you have coming up? Well, I'm working on a story about behind the scenes with the Pennsylvania Ballet and the Nutcracker. Um, and it was great to see how everything kind of comes together every year for this fantastic production that they do every year. Well, can't wait to see it. Thank you so much, Karen. Check it out Fridays at 8.30 on WHYY-TV. Uh, we will be back to wrap up this week's program, though, right after First Fact. <laughs> Next week on First, we're going to revisit our first special on the Vietnam War. We have stories on the Vietnam Veterans Wall in Washington, how the Huey helicopter changed the way medical units worked, and a local videographer who is creating his own Vietnam Veterans Oral History. That's next week, so join us for our regular edition of First Again in two weeks. For Chris Barish, Karen Smiles, Shirley Min, and Mark Eichmann, I'm Michelle Polston. Thank you for watching First, and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Here is what I would like you to do. How many of you need the stapler? All right, would you guys staple their draft on the bottom and the sheet that you filled out on the top? And I'm gonna come around and, and staple that bad boy for you. What is Sea Witch? It's like my favorite thing. It's a giant parade, but it's literally like, it's like forever long. So I thought it was helpful. Like I think like we helped each other and then I was able to help you. But when you guys come in on Tuesday, please, 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 Please make sure you print it out before class. So come down to my room in the morning for that open door policy.